One of the most basic philosophical questions is the relation between mind and world. How exactly does my mind relate to the world? I hope to know things about the world. I hope to understand it. I hope to be able to act in the world in a way that makes sense, is reasonable, and will let me succeed at achieving my goals. But it's hard to do that if I don't know how the thoughts, the desires, the intentions, the plans I make, the other aspects of my mental life correspond to the world. So the question of the relationship between mind and world is really fundamental. I want to know to what extent they correspond. And various things that I think, I want to know whether they're reflecting things that are really going on in the world or whether they're things that I am contributing, that I am maybe hoping for or fantasizing or in some other way getting wrong about reality. It's going to affect the way I act. It's going to affect the way I think, what I take to be a belief, what I take to be knowledge. I'm going to get into a lot of trouble conceivably if I've got a lot of things going on in my mind that correspond to nothing in the world. Descartes and Locke draw a fundamental distinction that's supposed to help us understand this question. The distinction between primary qualities of objects and secondary qualities. The primary qualities are really in the things themselves. They're inseparable from the things in th themselves. They're constant. Whereas the secondary qualities are a matter of how those things affect us. They're being contributed by the mind. So our ideas of secondary qualities, things like colors and tastes and textures, those are not really in the world. Those are being contributed by the mind. But things like extension, solidity, mass, movement, those are really in the world. Those are primary qualities of the things themselves. So to some extent, our minds are getting the world right, Descartes and Locke think. They are matching characteristics of the world. Descartes and Locke are what we'd call today scientific realists. Science is revealing the real essences of things, the true nature of things, and the qualities that are identified by science as going on in the world, those are the real qualities of objects. But everything else is something that our mind is contributing. It's a question of how those things are affecting our perceptual and cognitive faculties. They're not really in the world. That kind of distinction between the qualities that are really in the things themselves and described by science and the things that are not really in the things themselves but contributed by the mind came under surprising and sustained attack. It was begun by Bishop Berkeley responding to Locke, continued by David Hume, and then spawns an entire idealist tradition that has dominated much of the philosophical world for the last couple of centuries. So it's sort of surprising that that took place, given that our ordinary attitude, I think, is very much in line with a primary-secondary quality distinction. But today I want to talk about Berkeley and Hume and their attack on that distinction, their conception of qualities. They're going to say there is no place for the kind of distinction that Descartes and Locke are drawing, no way for us to say those qualities are really in the objects themselves. In fact, in their view, everything is going to end up being something like a secondary quality. Everything really turns out to depend on the mind. Well, Bishop George Berkeley himself was the Dean of Derry. He was Irish, lived in Northern Ireland specifically. He was a philosopher of the 18th century, as you can see here. And he was a very notable character, important in the history of philosophy for starting that entire tradition within Western philosophy. Here you see him pictured with a group of people referred to as his entourage. Berkeley held that idealism the thesis that everything in the world is mind dependent, that the entire world as we understand it is really a projection or construction of the mind. That's the best defense of common sense against skepticism. He thinks in particular that Descartes and Locke's ideas of objects make no sense and attacks the concept of a primary quality. He correspondingly attacks the concept of a substance, of a material object in general. In the end, he says there are only ideas. The entire world is a construction of the mind. The world has to be understood as fundamentally mental or spiritual. Well, how does this constitute a defense against skepticism? You might think of it as a surrender to the skeptic. After all, Berkeley seems to be saying, well, gosh, mind, everything is really mind, so nothing corresponds to the world. Wow, why aren't we skeptics as a result? He doesn't think that's what he's doing. Instead, he thinks what's happening is that the danger of skepticism is the gap between mind and world. I've got a set of ideas about things. I think certain things are true about the world. 
And if there's a gap between the way I think and what's really going on in the world, then there is the danger that a lot of my thinking diverges and a lot of my beliefs diverge from the way the world really is. That's what gives skepticism its power. We think about scenarios where I'm wrong about this or that or maybe everything as in Descartes' evil deceiver scenario. Well, how does he propose to get rid of that? Notice Descartes and Locke are saying, let's use science to help address that. Some things, yes, we're going to have to surrender to the skeptics. There really are no colors. There really are no textures. But there really is such a thing as mass. There really is extension in space. There really is solidity and motion and so forth. Barclay and Hume both are going to say, I don't think that will do it. Science will not give us a way of drawing that distinction. The best way of getting rid of the gap between mind and world is to push the world up into the mind. <laughs> okay, If the world is mental through and through, if all we've got are ideas, there's no problem about how I, our ideas match the world. The world consists of our ideas. That's it. So there's a sense in which it does get rid of skepticism. It gets rid of the gap between mind and the world because the world is entirely mental. It is itself a projection or construction of mind. So there is no gap. There's no place for the skeptic to get a foothold and drive a wedge and say, maybe we're wrong about this. What do you mean? We're wrong about our own ideas? Our ideas are our ideas. <laughs> and that is the world. That's all there is. There isn't any longer any gap. Well, that's an unusual strategy. But let's go back to what Descartes and Locke have in mind and see why Berkeley thinks it doesn't work. A primary quality is in the object itself. It's constant. It's the thing that we find even in the most minute part of the object. So things like extension, figure, motion, rest, solidity, impenetrability, number. These are things that are there in the wheat berry. They're also there in the flower. The secondary qualities can differ. They are the powers of the object to affect us. They are often not in its minute parts. So the color of the object, once we pound it, may become quite different. The way it sounds may be quite different. Drop a pound of flour on the floor, it's going to sound differently from a pound of wheat berries being dropped on the floor. And in general, the secondary qualities are going to change between the large parts of the object and the small parts of the object. Sometimes we will perceive them that way, sometimes not. They are dependent on the mind, dependent on our own perceptual and cognitive faculties. Well, that's the distinction. That's the way it's supposed to go. But Barclay says, actually, we have no basis for thinking that any of our ideas correspond to some mind-independent reality. The whole idea here is supposed to be that some ideas, like the idea of mass or the idea of velocity, the idea of motion, the idea of taking up some space, those really correspond to the world. But things like color and texture and taste don't. Barclay says, actually, I don't see how there's a basis for thinking that any of them do, even the primary ones. There are several reasons he gives for this. One of the arguments is that we can't judge their resemblance to reality. Locke and Descartes say the primary qualities are adequate. They correspond to the way the world really is. Barclay says, how would you know? Our perceptions of heights, of weight, of Width and so on, he says, moreover, are not constant. They vary while the objects remain unchanged. So that's the second argument. First argument is there's no way to judge this resemblance. We can't have access. We basically can't get outside of our heads to judge whether our ideas are matching the world. The second one is you say the test is whether they're constant and invariable and inseparable. Actually, primary qualities are just as inseparable, just as variable. So let's look at those arguments in turn. Here is the first argument about resemblance. Barclay says an idea can be like nothing but an idea. A color or figure can be like nothing but another color, another figure. If we look but ever so little into our thoughts, we shall find it impossible for us to conceive a likeness except only between our ideas. So the whole thought of Locke and Descartes of a primary quality is it's an idea that matches the world. But what do you mean, match the world? What do you mean there's a resemblance between this, that it's adequate in the sense that it matches or corresponds to what's in the world exactly? How would we know is partly Bar Barclay's issue. <laughs> and partly the issue is what would that even mean? An idea is an idea. It's something in my mind. And it's supposed to be something that corresponds to or matches precisely or resembles something that's really in the world. 
well, I don't understand what this sense of resemblance could be. So I don't know what it would mean for an idea to resemble something that's not an idea. But also, even if that made sense, I wouldn't know how on earth to get outside the realm of my ideas to be able to compare it to a thing unaffected by my ideas. So in a way, he's giving us a version of that argument from comparison, saying, I am always perceiving a thing as processed by my faculties. I am always perceiving the thing by virtue of an idea. What's before my mind is always an idea. I can't compare the idea to something that is not an idea. I can compare ideas to ideas. That I can do. But I can't compare ideas to something else. So not only do I deny, he's saying, that there is any way for there to be a resemblance here, but even if there were, how could I know it? I'd never be able to get at the thing itself to compare. So I think what really is going on here is something that relates to Locke's conception. When we were talking about Locke on ideas, I pointed out that the way he characterizes them is actually somewhat puzzling. He says that an idea is whatsoever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks. It's whatever it is which the mind can be employed about in thinking. It's what his mind is applied about while thinking. Well, I tried to reconstruct that in terms of first order cognitive abilities. But Berkeley is taking Locke's words very literally and very directly. He's saying it's what I'm thinking about. It is what is before my mind when I'm thinking. Well, if that's right, then I can never think about the triangle, for example, directly. I never think about the paper directly. Always what's before the mind is my idea of the paper. So my thoughts are really about the idea. Now that's what worried us before about Locke's definition. But Berkeley is going to push that in a certain direction. He's going to say, look, if what's before my mind when I'm thinking is always an idea, and then you ask me to judge resemblance, what am I doing? What's before the mind here? Let's say it's these two hands. <laughs> I'm asked to judge whether this is similar to that. OK, I can know how to do that because they're hands. But what am I doing when I do it? I've got two ideas, two perceptions in my mind, and I'm comparing those. So I'm doing it by comparing the ideas. Now you say, don't compare the two hands to one another. Don't compare the two ideas of the hands you have to one another. Instead, compare the idea of this hand to the hand as it is in itself, without using an idea. But wait, whatever is before my mind, what I think is an idea, according to Locke. I never get at the thing itself without an idea in the way, without an idea in between. So I can't do it. A, I don't know what it even means, since I have no experience of these things in themselves, to say what that kind of resemblance would even be. But even if it makes sense, I can't get out of the realm of ideas to do it. Every time I employ my mind in thinking, I've got an idea. So at best, I could compare my idea of the thing to the idea of the idea of the thing. Maybe I could do that. But to compare the idea to the thing, impossible. No way for me to do it. Here is a little diagram that might indicate the general kind of thing that Locke seems to have in mind and what drives Berkeley crazy about it. Within my mind, I have a certain thought of a triangle, let's say, since that's my favorite example throughout this course. That thought has a certain content. Hey, that's a triangle. It's using the content of my idea of a triangle. And that represents that individual object. Well, OK, that's supposed to be the picture. And indeed, often that's described as the representative theory of perception. I represent the triangle in my mind. But wait a minute, Barclay says. I don't quite understand what's happening here. Let's take a look at how this is supposed to develop. I've got an object I'm perceiving here, like this triangle. And I, within my mind, do that by having a thought. There's a relation of perception. I perceive the triangle, so in some way the triangle is causing me to have this perception. And it's got a certain content. It's related to my idea or concept of a triangle. And that concept applies to that triangle. I'm leaving out a lot of things here about the word that might go along and relations of meaning and reference and all of that. But it, the point emerges with something very simple. Because notice what's going on. How am I able to think about this triangle? I think about it by virtue of the fact of having an idea. Now I say, whenever I'm thinking, that's what's before the mind, the idea. So think of the mind as something like a screen. And what's playing on the screen are my ideas. Ah, now, 
The question that Locke and Descartes are trying to solve is this question of the relationship between my idea and the thing, right? I want to know whether there is in particular the kind of resemblance that will allow me to say this idea is adequate to the thing. It's a good representation of the thing. I want there to be a re relation of representation here, and so I need to judge the adequacy of this, to use Locke's term, and I'm going to do that, Barclay says, in terms of resemblance. But now, notice what's going on. I have to judge the resemblance between my idea and the thing, but everything that is within my mind here that I have access to is an idea. So how do I get the thing itself? I've got to compare now this, that idea, to this, this thing. But how on earth do I do that? You want me to think about that thing in itself? Well, I do that by virtue of having this idea. If you want me to think about the idea, okay, I guess I can have an idea of an idea. <laughs> but notice, I, that's not going to help me. I still don't get at this relation. I now have to think about this relation. You say, well, think about the idea of that. Well, now I get something else here. I can have ideas about my ideas about my ideas, but you get the point. I never get outside of my own mind to the thing itself. So I can't judge the resemblance. So, first of all, I have no experience of this kind of relationship between an idea and a thing. And remember, Barclay, like Locke, is an empiricist. He's saying, if I have an idea, it's coming from some impression, some perception or experience. But I don't have an experience of this. All the mental experiencing I'm having of comparing is within my own mind of ideas to ideas, or ideas of one thing to ideas of another thing. And then, where could I do this? It's the moment you ask me this question and make me think about it, I'm forming more ideas. And so I never get at the thing itself. I can't get out of it. Now, that's part of what's driving Barclay crazy. But part of it is, and this is beautiful in a way, he frames this in terms of a dilemma for Locke. He says, look, I, I don't understand. In this kind of picture, can I think about the triangle? Can I perceive the triangle? He says, I ask whether these supposed originals or external things, of which our ideas or the pictures or representations, be themselves perceivable or no. If they are, then they're ideas, and we've gained our point. But if you say they're not, I appeal to anyone, whether it be sense, to assert that a color is like something that's invisible, hard or soft, like something that's intangible, and so on of the rest. So he's basically saying, okay, I want to ask you a question about this thing. I want to ask a question about this triangle, the thing itself this external object, this original, as he puts it. And I want to say, is that something I can perceive or no? Locke, you've said that ideas are what's before the mind. Well, you also characterize this in representational terms. That idea is supposed to represent the thing out there in the mind, or out there in the world. Well, can I perceive that thing or not? If you say yes, I can perceive that thing. Wait a minute. <laughs> what do I perceive? Everything before the mind is an idea. So if you answer, yes, I can perceive this, you've just put it in the mind and made it into an idea by your own definition of idea. Suppose you say, no, I can't perceive it. Only uh, ideas are the things I perceive. Then it's even worse because now you're saying, okay, I, I can't perceive this. I can't see it. It's invisible. And you're saying this idea is like something invisible? That doesn't make any sense. Invisible things don't have three sides and three angles. This has three sides and three angles. What are you talking about? So in short, Barclay is saying there's something confused about the way that Locke is describing this entire scenario. What's before the mind is supposedly an idea. But the idea is supposed to represent a thing. And yet, whenever we think about anything, we're thinking about an idea. Well, either that triangle, that thing, is just another idea, and it's really mental and mind-dependent, or it's not, but then this whole talk of representation makes no sense. So he thinks he's got Locke in a real trap. What are you going to say about these external objects? Can I perceive them? If yes, they're mental, by your own definition. If not, then they can't resemble any of these things that are ideas. And either way, 
the theory is sunk. So, in our diagram, we can put it this way. Do I have a relation of perception between my thought and that actual triangle as external to me? If so, that object becomes an idea. And if not, we can't evaluate resemblance. There's no way to talk about adequacy or inadequacy. The conclusion that Barclay draws is that there are no primary qualities. Extension, figure, and motion are only ideas existing in the mind. An idea can be like nothing but another idea. Consequently, neither they nor their archetypes can exist in an unperceiving substance. Hence, it's plain that the very notion of what's called matter or corporeal substance involves a contradiction in it. So notice here, he's arguing there are no primary qualities. The moment you postulate some quality that is in the thing itself, I'm forced to talk about the idea of that. And ideas can be like nothing but another idea. So actually, they can't exist independently of the mind. If I'm to talk about adequacy or representation or any kind of match or resemblance, then they have to be mental, along with the ideas that I can characterize in this way. But then they aren't really substances. They aren't really matter. They're creatures of the mind. And so there is no way to talk about qualities that are really out there in the thing that itself, independently of the mind. There is nothing independent of the mind. Well, that is, he thinks, what follows from taking seriously Locke's talk that we think by having ideas before the mind, and those ideas are meant to represent things. Those things end up being mental. And if that's true, there's no such thing as a primary quality. There's no such thing as a material substance. Let's take a look at the other argument he gives, an argument based on variability. The whole way of distinguishing primary from secondary qualities, he says, is supposed to be that the primary qualities are inseparable. They are constant, but actually they're not. People's perceptions vary, says the argument from variability, and there's no way to decide among them, so we should suspend judgment. Well, Barclay goes back to that skeptical form of argument and uses it against Locke and says, you say this is a reason for us to think that the secondary qualities aren't really in the world. They can vary. They can depend on context. They can depend on the perceiver. And there's no way to decide what would really be in the object, so we should suspend judgment about that and, in fact, deny that they are in the object. He says, but wait a minute. The same thing applies to the primary qualities, too. They also vary, and there's no way to decide among them. So you claim that this will allow us to draw the distinction this set of qualities is invariable and inseparable. This one is variable and separable. Barclay says they're all variable. They're all separable. Nothing ends up being a primary quality by that criterion. The perceptions we have of primary qualities vary too. Now why? Well, let's take a look, he says, at a mite's view of the world. This is an actual photograph of dust mites on a carpet. Now, to us, that carpet might look clean. <laughs> it might look bug-free. It might look as if it's a smooth, textured carpet. To a mite, it looks very different. It's crawling with other mites. It's actually very rough and has a kind of texture that's quite complex. It looks like a bowl of spaghetti. And so the mite's view of that is very different from our own view. Even though, notice here, we're not talking just about texture in the sense of being a secondary quality. We're talking about the actual shape of the thing. The shape looks really different from a mite's point of view. This is an even more disturbing photograph. These are mites on human skin. That is what human skin that feels smooth to us looks like to one of these mites. It looks like a series of caverns, deeply disturbing. Looks like that person badly needs some hand cream. But whatever we want to conclude about that, the mites view it is really different from our view. Even though, again, we're talking about the shape. We're talking about the extension of it. We're talking about things that ought to be among the primary qualities. But perceptions vary among species, yes, but even for us. Philonus, one of the characters in the dialogue here, says, from what you've laid down, it follows that both the extension by you perceived and that perceived by the mite itself, as likewise all those perceived by lesser animals, are each of them the true extension of the mite's foot. After all, these are perceptions of a primary quality, so they're supposed to be in the things themselves. But, Philonus says, by that criterion, you're led into an absurdity. 
we see this as having a certain kind of, now I don't want to say just texture, but a certain kind of shape. The mite views it as having a very different kind of shape. What does that tell us? If shape is a primary quality, that's supposed to be really in the thing. But is the, it's the shape as perceived by the mite that's in the thing, or the shape as perceived by us that's in the thing? We've got to say, if we really take that to correspond in both cases, that they're both in the thing, but that's a manifest contradiction. Well, it's not just a question of different species. Maybe we want to say, I don't care how a mite sees things, or how an elephant would see it, or a bat would see it. I mean, maybe we should, but suppose you say, I, let's stay to the human realm. The same problem emerges. Philonus says, look, think about a human being. As we approach an object or recede from it, the visible extension varies, being at one distance 10 or 100 times greater than another. Doth it not therefore follow from hence likewise that it's not really inherent in the object? My perceptions vary depending upon, well, all sorts of things, maybe dependent on my mood, depending upon the time of day, how tired I am, but also on the basis of my distance from the object. So here's an example. This is a mountain known as Shiprock in northwestern New Mexico. It was something that was used as a guidepost by people who were on wagon trains across the west headed for California and other destinations. You can see it from hundreds of miles away. And here it is from hundreds of miles away. It looks rather small there, and it's hard to tell how far away you are. That might be a smaller mountain, and you're not that far away. Or it might be a very large mountain, and you're quite far away. In any case, as you approach Shiprock, it looks bigger and bigger. And by the time you get right up to it, you realize this thing is huge. That's why you can see it hundreds of miles away, and why it was a good guidepost for people seeking to cross the desert. Well, that sort of thing is not just something that happens in wagon trains. It's something that happens all the time. I see something across the room, and it looks very small. In fact, you might ask me a question about it. I might find it hard to answer. I could hold up these keys, for example, and ask you about the shape of the keys. And you might say, well, they look very small. But if I bring it toward the camera, they look larger and larger. And indeed, if I bring them closer to my eyes, they look bigger and bigger in my visual field. That kind of thing is commonplace. I see something far away as I'm driving. It looks very small, far away. I might be driving toward Dallas. I see the Dallas skyline, but I'm far away. And I think, well, Dallas doesn't look that impressive. But then when I get up close to it, I realize, oh, this is a big city, and it looks much more impressive. The same thing can happen when you're flying over something. Imagine being in an airplane looking down on, let's say, New York City. I've often flown over New York City. You look down, and from a distance or a very high height, it doesn't look that big, and the buildings there are barely discernible. It looks tiny, but on the other hand, when you're flying much lower over it, things look large. And of course, if you're there just in a building, like at the top of the Empire State Building looking at it, it looks huge. So New York City is something that looks gigantic. When you're close up, it can look small if you're far away. You might have had the experience being very, in a very tall tower, a tall office building or something like that, where you look down at the road and people look like ants. Well, that's because they look really small when you're far away. On the other hand, when you're up close, you realize, no, they're the normal size for people. And that sort of phenomenon is every day. So yes, the sizes of things can vary, not only from context to context. I mean, something might look much smaller if I put it next to something that's really large. And in fact, often people, to take a photograph of something really large, will put something next to it or have a person stand next to it or something so that you get a sense of scale and so that you can see Look, I know it looks small in the photograph, but this thing is really large. And that's because all of these things can affect our perception, our perception of primary qualities. The same thing can happen with respect to something like mass or motion. The same motion might feel very fast or very slow, depending upon the context. In this case, not how close we are to it, though that can be true too. Watch an airplane go across the sky. The plane is going at hundreds of miles an hour but it looks from our vantage point on the ground as if it's traveling very slowly. The same thing can happen if you've ever flown a plane. I have, and when you stop flying a plane and get into your car, for example, the speed you're going in a car feels so unbelievably slow. 
I had a friend who was a pilot and he was constantly getting speeding tickets. And it's not really just because he was the kind of person who speeds a lot and ignores the law. It's because when you've been up in an airplane, the speeds you get used to are the speeds of going hundreds of miles an hour. When you then are on the ground traveling at 60, it feels like you're crawling. <laughs> and so that kind of thing is a phenomenon we're familiar with. But wait, velocity was a primary quality. So is that airplane moving across the sky quickly or not? Well, we're perceiving a primary quality of motion there. But the feeling for the pilot and the feeling of us on the ground can't both be right. They can't both match the actual velocity. And the same thing is true of driving a car when you haven't driven in a while and then when you've been flying an airplane. It's the same velocity, but one time it feels fast to you, another time it feels slow. It can't be both fast and slow, but again, motion, velocity is supposed to be a primary quality. So it looks like we're immediately led into trouble. Philonus concludes in the dialogue, this isn't in the object. He says, is, is it not the very same reasoning to conclude that there is no extension or figure in an object? Because to one eye it shall seem little, smooth, and round, while at the same time it appears to the other great, uneven, and regular. Hylas, who is defending the Locke Descartes point of view in the dialogue, says, uh, the very same. But does this latter fact ever happen? Philonus says, you may at any time make the experiment by looking with one eye bare and with another through a microscope. So doubt the examples I've given about mites, about speeds of airplanes, about other things. Maybe they don't convince you. But Philo says, hey, look at a leaf. Here's how a leaf looks every day. And we can describe not just its secondary qualities, its green and so on, but its primary qualities. Describe its shape. Describe the, the actual um, figure that it corresponds to. Describe it in any way you like. And now look through a microscope. It looks like that. Now, yes, its secondary qualities have changed, but the primary qualities have changed too. That bottom edge, for example, looks smooth. It's not smooth. It's pretty bumpy. <laughs> and the same thing is going to be true of all sorts of primary qualities of the thing. Your perception will be very different through a microscope. You'll be seeing it very up close, and your perception of the size, of the velocity, of the shape, all of that is going to be quite different. Conclusion, Barclay draws, there's no distinction between primary and secondary qualities. They're all in the mind alone. If we insist on using those terms at all, the point is all of those qualities are really secondary qualities. And so we should be idealists about all qualities. None of them are in the things themselves. They are all in the mind alone. Everything is really a construction or a projection of the mind. Every single quality we attribute to an object is mind dependent. It is variable. It is separable. It is the kind of thing that is there in the mind, but is not there in the object. I want to leave you with a question. We've been attacking here with Barclay that distinction between the primary and secondary qualities. But could we do this in a different way? Instead of saying all qualities are really primary, could we do it in the opposite way? Saying actually they're all in the object. They're all primary qualities. Now notice we would have to get rid of Locke's idea that everything before the mind is really an idea. We'd have to say, no, I can perceive the triangle. I don't have to just have an idea before the mind. The triangle can really be before my mind. I would also have to say that actually these tests of constancy and invariableness, maybe those aren't the right tests. The right test is something else. But even a secondary quality, maybe I could push all of those into the thing. I can say, ah, you think the yellow isn't really in the paper? What if it is? What if we end up saying, look, being yellow is just reflecting certain wavelengths of light. And the paper really does reflect those wavelengths. That really is a quality of the paper itself. I think these arguments, as framed, are quite effective against the way Locke sets it all up. But maybe the general problem of mind and world here could be addressed in a kind of Barclayan spirit, but in a different way. Instead of pushing the world up into the mind, maybe we could push the mind, in effect, down into the world and say, actually, all of those ideas are about things in the world. 
Our thinking is about the things. It's not about the ideas. The thing can itself be before the mind. We can make direct reference to the thing in our thoughts and in our language. And maybe we could instead then say, actually, all those qualities are really in the things themselves. They're all primary qualities. It's not just a question of affecting us in certain ways. Being red might be reflecting wavelengths of light of a certain kind. Same thing with being yellow. Maybe the same thing is true of all of the other secondary qualities. So even if Berkeley succeeds at denying the distinction, maybe we don't have to become idealists ev about everything. Could we instead become realists about all of it and attribute all of this to the things themselves?